You're listening to Boobies and Newbies. Find and follow Boobies and Newbies at Boobies Podcast across platforms and on boobiesandnewbies.com. And don't forget at Real Kelly Ray on TikTok because TikTok thinks I'm making porn if I use boobies in the handle. Thanks, TikTok. podcast that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. The episode you're about to listen to, Nostalgic Love, Romantic Updates to Stories We Love, was originally recorded on April 1st, 2023. Now, if you're new to Boobies and Newbies, Tit Talk is a monthly panel discussion between the folks who write romance and the readers who love them. Join me every month as I moderate a discussion with a new topic each time amongst readers, bloggers, podcasters, authors, and more, all in the name of romance. I, for one, am a huge fan of adaptations, retellings, and reimaginings of romance favorites from Shakespeare's classic comedies to rom-coms of the 80s and 90s. During this panel, we discussed the process of adapting existing source material, highlighted a few favorites, including some books by our panelists, and explored stories that we haven't seen yet and would like to see adapted. As always, you can revisit our past Tit Talk episodes on the Boobies and Newbies YouTube channel if you prefer the visual format. The best way to support the podcast is to follow us across our socials at Boobies Podcast. And of course, if you've got a few extra bucks to spare and you want to go the extra mile towards supporting your favorite podcast, you might consider subscribing to the Boobies and Newbies Patreon. I will, of course, leave links for all of the above in today's show notes. But for now, please sit back and enjoy the show. Today, I'm super excited because rom-coms are something that are so near to my heart, as well as just adaptations that I think are circling the world of romance right now. And I'm loving every second of it. So that's what we're talking about today is stories that make for the best adaptations for romance, um, as well as the stories that inspire us. We maybe want to see more of in romance. So I'm going to go ahead and let all of the panelists introduce themselves. So um, I'm just going to kick it over to Allison because you're on my side first. So over to you, Allison. Hello, um, I'm Allison Cochran. Um, I am a queer romance author. So my debut novel was called The Charm Offensive. Um, And then my second novel, Kiss Her Once For Me, came out last November. All right. I'm Libby Hart. Um, My debut novel was Talk Flirty To Me. And I have a book coming out in May called Planes, Trains, and All The Feels. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm Allie Parker and I run the podcast Romance Ever After and am Chaos Maven for the rom-com bracket. <laughs> yes, which I will 100% want to talk about more later. So we will come back <laughs> to that. <laughs> but I guess first things first, I always want to know from everybody, whether they're a reader, writer, podcaster, whoever, just sort of how their romance journey began. So as a reader, writer, et cetera, when did it all begin for you? And I'll just throw it back over to Allison, but feel free to jump in and answer anytime. Yeah, um, for me, I think I've just like always really been fascinated by love stories. Like my memories of, I don't know if it was like Disney indoctrination, but um, (laughs) I like remember always caring like way too much about the love stories in Disney movies as a kid, even though like, They were terrible in the 90s, so I don't know what I was thinking. Um, But, like, my first really, like, salient memory of romance um, is that my dad, like, loves rom-coms, like, and he loves, like, Nora Ephron films. And so uh, I used to watch, like, While You Were Sleeping and Sleepless in Seattle, like, with him, like, on VHS. I love that. Um, Yeah, yeah. And so we we used to always watch them together and, like, as a 10-year-old. So, like, as a 10-year-old, Sleepless in Seattle was, like, my favorite movie. So that was super normal. Um, But, yeah, I think that's my my earliest kind of introduction to the romance genre. Yeah, definitely. To to piggyback off that, I remember being way too young to watch 
the things I was watching um, and caring way too much about the three seconds of screen time for the love story and those like action movies that other people would be watching. I'm like, why are we spending so much time on the uh, high speed car chase when there are two people who need to kiss? Um, and just all those, all those like awarenesses of, of the love that was happening on screen and stuff. And I just remember being a person who definitely was like making the gummy bears kiss as a kid and like, being, like giggly about it. And, <laughs> um, but I actually didn't read a lot of romance until I was, until right before the pandemic, I was reading all kinds of other things. And then the gospel of Christina Lauren fell into my hands. And I was, I remember saying to someone like, I didn't know books could be like this. I didn't know you were allowed to have fun with books. I thought there needed to be like excessive pain at all times. And so, um, it was just really exciting. It was like a very marked moment of like, oh, okay. What if we had fun and told those stories too? Not that there isn't room for all the complex feelings, but just, um, the, the, the calm of the ROM, right? <laughs> like that, that really appealed to me. Uh, so for me, um, and I talk a little bit about this in um, the Black Love Matters uh, book that was put out by Jessica Pride um, last year. Um, for me, I started, you know, watching a lot of movies, rom-coms with family like everybody else. Um, my mom was a big movie watcher, so we always watched movies together. And I realized I really loved romance um, because, you know, just like you, Livy, like, those two seconds of kissing, that was the, that was the most important part to me. Right. I didn't realize, I didn't start reading romance specifically until maybe I was about 13. Um, I, I got my hands on a floating copy of Bridget Jones in the house. And I read mm -hmm. that and I was like, Oh, this is good, but I want more of the stuff where she's actually happy and not Pratt falling all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I fell into reading categories. Uh, I think I started reading some Harlequin categories and then I was like, oh yeah, this is good stuff. And it was just like me just trying to find as much of that as possible. Um, I was like taking some of my lunch money every week to go <laughs> on Tuesday, book release day to the borders on the way home to like buy whatever book I could. Um, and like, that was just kind of like the beginning of my love affair with romance and hasn't left me yet. I love that. Thank you all for sharing a little bit about yourselves and your romance reading journeys. I, I love that everybody has their own introduction to romance. I mean, I love Ali mentioned Bridget Jones diary. <laughs> and um, I, I too, like Allison kind of grew up on while you were sleeping and sleepless in Seattle, ironically, also my dad being the one to kind oh of introduce gosh. me to that. those movies. Like I, I love it. My my dad is definitely like the rom com, um, like sappy one in the family. Although he would never admit it, he would never <laughs> say that. Um, but one hundred percent. So I love that. I love that. There's so many things that we we have in common when it comes to this and i think that's true for a lot of the romance community so just goes to show we have so much in common but um when talking about adaptations and retellings and reimaginings of you know whether it's a shakespearean classic or um you know our favorite 90s flicks mm -hmm. what kinds of stories do you think make for the best kind of source material to like draw inspiration from? Mm, that's a great question. I think for me, the ones that I find that are the most, that, that have the best adaptations are the ones where that the beats of it are so like crystal clear that no matter how you transform the story, people immediately latch onto it. Like um, I'm totally, I think it's called All Stirred Up. Um, it's a retelling of persuasion mm -hmm. and I didn't know it was going to be a retelling of persuasion. I just, I honestly just picked up the audio book because Mary Jane Wells narrated it and I will listen to anything she narrates. <laughs> um, she could read me the phone book. Um, and I was listening to it and then like about halfway through, I went, Oh, this is persuasion because like, you know, it had like the beats of them coming back, her family being batty and spending all their money and her, you know, being the dependable one. And 
you know, the reuniting with her love interest, who's kind of mad at her, and, you know, the meddling aunt figure, like, like, oh, yeah, these are things that everybody kind of remembers about Persuasion. They don't necessarily remember everything, but they remember, like, the big stuff. And so when the big stuff is, like, just really sticks with you, I think those are, like, the, the best stories, too. Yeah, I'm thinking about when there's one element that is so intensely related to one movie like 13 going on 30 mm -hmm. once you have that one piece of woke up was 30 or whatever that that's all <laughs> you need and then everything else you do from there can be you know your own magic to it and that's that's kind of what sticks out for me and sometimes like you were saying it's sneaky you don't always even realize it's a retelling and then that mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. and since every romance is you know between those two core people i think it's really magic when those side relationships come into play because then you can mm. sometimes start to see oh a meddling aunt oh okay now that that's kind of cluing you in as to what they're trying to to do and so yeah i would say definitely those big moments that sort of belong to one movie and make them iconic that's what i like to yeah. look for um, I guess for me, like, I like the way, Ali, you explained it so well that, like, it's stories that have those really clear beats or, like, old stories that have tropes that we, like, use, you know, like, Jane Austen works so well at adaptations because right. those are the, the tropes we see in romance already. And so the way that, like, you can play around with those stories is really fun. Um, but for me, when it comes to retellings, like, I'm just drawn to any story that I kind of just am like, but what if it was gay? Like, um, so I just want to like take <laughs> stories that, that I love. I just want to take like stories that I really love and be like, okay, but like, how would this, this classic, like heteronormative love story be mm -hmm. different um, if it were queer instead? Um, and that's what like draws me as both a reader and a writer. I love that. I, when I, when I lived in LA and I was still trying to do like the screenwriting game, um, I feel like that's, that's kind of the way, and I'm sure a lot of this applies to the world of publishing as well, but that's how you would want to pitch a story idea or a script is like, oh, it's, it's Groundhog's Day, but make it gay. It's, you know, this, <laughs> but it has, uh, you know, it, it it's re role reversal. Now it's like the woman pursuing the man, you know? And so, I do think um, having those moments that people can relate to and like reference, because when you hear Groundhog's Day, you know, oh, it's time repeating over and over again, mm -hmm. 13 going on 30. It's her waking up, Freaky Friday, body swap. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's it's all these like iconic beats and moments that people, if you just mention the title, can mm -hmm automatically relate to you. And I know I just named movies, but I think a lot of <laughs> Jane Austen and uh, Shakespeare plays also are have those moments that people know, oh, this is a, you know, Romeo and Juliet story, not as much of a rom-com, but it could be in the world <laughs> of, of romance. <laughs> yeah, and it... no, go, go ahead, Lily. No, I was just gonna say, but what if? <laughs> 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 you know, but I think that's, the temptation to like, especially with Jane Austen and Shakespeare to modernize it, to right those wrongs that we read. Like there are moments we love in everything, but like, especially to a modern reader, you you see those like glaring things that like stick in your craw and you're like, ooh, but what if I did this, mm -hmm. but I did it better. And I don't mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't blame, you know, the woman for this, or I don't, you know, <laughs> or I don't mistreat side characters. You know, I, I I rectify all of these glaring issues so I can actually truly love the story the way it needs to be loved. I'm so glad you said that, Ali, because I, I think that is so true that a lot of the times when writers decide to adapt a story that it's, I want to right the wrongs of how the story was told. I want to, I want to write Romeo and Juliet, but what if, they had a conversation and didn't, you know, unalive themselves. What if <laughs> they, you know, like, and, and I do think there's a lot of that when it does come to retellings is how can I, one, put my, my stamp on this, but to give the characters the ending that they deserved and maybe didn't get before, um, which I think is kind of what leads into the world of fan fiction is this idea that like, I want to create these relationships and write stories for the characters that I think were done some kind of injustice. That's it. That's uh -huh. all I had to say about fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I wish 
more about fan fiction, though, if we need to. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, I, we, can, we can pivot. We can pivot. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny, though, because, like, I, I don't know enough about fan fiction. I know a lot of people do get started reading and writing romance when it comes to fan fiction. That wasn't my route, so I don't... I don't have more to say about it. I do think it's like very commendable that people who do write it. So yeah, I think I, think you, I was just going to say, actually, what we're really talking about is kind of fan fiction. We just don't use the exact same names and we are making substantial changes, but they do that in fanfic as well. Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't have called myself a fanfic writer, but I was busting out some, some Twilight fanfic. Not even hey. uh, so, <laughs> I think, um, you're a fan of not necessarily a specific character, but maybe of a trope. And you're like, I'm mm -hmm. going to do this until, you know, I find a story there for myself. But um, yeah, I think when you're so inspired by something that you have to take action, like that's just fan fiction, no matter what you do with it. Um, like mm -hmm. I saw Easy A, which is probably one of my favorite retellings. Oh my gosh, I could talk about it all day. And I have never been more inspired. I was like, oh my gosh, they didn't even have to change too much. They didn't have to because mm -hmm. modernizing it was enough of the change because of how our attitudes about sex have changed and all these other things. And they even- And haven't changed. And haven't changed. <laughs> they have not changed enough. And so um, I just thought that was so brilliant. And so, yeah, it's just, you get inspired and you're like, I can do this. Like Ali was saying, I can make this, but I can make it better. I can make it safer for readers. I can make it all these things. So yeah. Ali, did you have more you wanted to add? I feel like you were going to say something oh God, before too. I'm a golden retriever, so it's like oh. that. <laughs> It'll come back to you when the moment <laughs> is right. Um, I, I should have also mentioned this at the beginning for everybody watching uh, that Nisha Sharma was supposed to be joining us, but she had a family emergency, so um, she won't be here. But I did just want to, you know, for a second, promo uh, her books because her If Shakespeare Was an Anti-Trilogy is so mm -hmm. fantastic. Do Dating Dr. Dill was actually a book we reviewed on Movies and Newbies for the podcast and had such a fun time reading. And I know that the second book is coming out later this year. I have an arc of it on my Kindle that I'm like, you have things you need to read before this, Kelly, but also <laughs> I want to read it now. Um, so, but her, her trilogy is inspired by uh, Shakespeare's comedies. So um, if people haven't had a chance to read Dating Dr. Dill yet, highly recommend. It was probably one of my favorite reads of last year. So um, we love you, Nisha. <laughs> <laughs> but moving on. Um, so <laughs> and now, uh, as we've already talked about, it's not only a book sometimes or a play when it comes to Shakespeare that inspires an adaptation or a retelling. Sometimes it's a 80s road trip movie. Sometimes <laughs> it's a 90s rom-com. So I'd love to um, turn this next question to Allison specifically, whose sapphic holiday romance, Kiss Her Once for Me, uh, was inspired by the 1995 rom-com While You Were Sleeping. Um, what about this movie in particular inspired you to write the book, Allison? Um, I wish I had like a profound answer to that. Um, <laughs> but the truth is like pretty embarrassing. So I like had just sold my first book to a publisher and we were like, you know, in that phase of like my editor was going to be doing revision notes and all of that. So we were just waiting and my agent was like, all right, like book two ideas. What do you got? Um, and I had nothing like, I don't know, it was June of 2020. And we were like in a horrible part of the pandemic where I was only talking to my sister and my dog. And I just like had no creative thoughts in my head. Um, and so I was like trying to come up with like ideas. And I think I made a list of like, but make it gays where I was like coming up with like all of these different like movies and books that I could um, play around with and, and turn into like sapphic stories. Uh, and I thought about while you were sleeping and I settled on it because um, I like firmly believe that Bill Pullman in that movie, like looks like a Portland lesbian, um, like 100%. in just like, like the best way. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my gosh, like that's so like such a natural um, adaptation because like he has like the floppy hair and like the flannel with a Carhartt on over and just like stomping around in some work boots. And like, and it's he just... makes furniture. I know it's so lesbian. It's crafty. I, it's so good. <laughs> um, and so like, that was it. I was just like, oh yeah. Like Bill Pullman, 
like this explains so much about me and my crush on Bill Pullman growing up. Like it's because like he straight up looks like a lesbian in that movie, like a super hot lesbian. So um, that was it. Like that was kind of what sealed the deal for me. And um, I started playing around with, yeah, with that concept. I, I mean, I love that. And I especially love that you left the character's name as Jack in the book, because I will say this is something, maybe it's just a personal thing. This is something that really annoys me is when I do see a movie or I read a book and it's clearly an adaptation, but there's been some kind of gender swap that they change the name. Um, and I, I personally would love the name to stay the same. Like I, just because I love, I love being able to know that this is coming from that source material. And it kind of makes me look at the original in like a different way. Um, if I have like that same name for context, but yeah, I don't, I, especially with all the names that we have today that are so unique and um, really not relegated to one gender. Um, I would like to see more of that. <laughs> yeah. I just thought it was hot. Jack. I just thought like a woman yeah. named Jack would be hot. So I was yeah. like, yeah, that's perfect. Like I'll change everybody <laughs> else's names, but like <laughs> she will still be Jack. Yeah. We knew Bill Pullman. Yeah, there it is. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and then over to Livy, because when I first received um, word about your upcoming rom-com planes, trains and all the feels, my eye immediately jumped to, a romantic update on the classic John Hughes penned comedy. And I immediately was thinking, oh, I wonder mm -hmm. if this was inspired by a particular John Hughes film or just John Hughes all around. So what do you think? You know, it, it, it was so many different things that came together at the same time, kind of what you were saying, Allison, about, you know, you know, you're sitting down to write a book. So in this situation, it was not my first book. So, um, there's such there's that difference between walking up with something in your hand saying this was born of me here you go and then coming <laughs> up with it um, with a team and all those other elements that sort of impact it but I know that one thing that was really really that compelled me was I wanted something that wasn't a romance but felt like it could be um, and I wanted in this situation to take what is a, a road trip book but not not entirely and there it was just like all these almosts like and bring them all together. And I mean, I wish <laughs> it's like Steve, like with so many things, I'm like, this would be better if those characters were gay, you know, <laughs> but like, <laughs> the movie, um, you know, I call, I always say Steve and John, because that's who they are to me. I know that their characters <laughs> have different names, but it's Steve Martin and John Candy. Like we're, we're going to, we're going to say their names. Right. But um, I, it was such a beautiful story of friendship and it was so many other things um, that, you know, made it just really interesting to try to adapt. But more than that, more than anything else, I am an agent of chaos, first, foremost, and always. <laughs> In order to be true to myself, I was like, whatever we do with this, it has to be absolutely chaotic. And I think it is, um, hopefully in a good way. But um, so yeah, just taking all these different, like what could be obstacles, but also, you know, exciting things like, well, how do you take something that is so beautiful and perfect and friendship based and, you know, all these things, but still honor it and still do it justice, mm -hmm. um, but also make it a romance and also make it something that people who maybe don't even have any, you know, tie to the original would enjoy. So um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question because again, agent of chaos, but <laughs> I, I, I just remember thinking the whole time, this doesn't have to change the original. The original is so perfect. I'm just right. gonna take the pieces I love the most and just play with them. And that was, you know, explosions and things. <laughs> I know, but I think that's important to note too. It's, it's, you're not necessarily like seeking to rewrite planes, trains, and automobiles. Like you're not seeking to like redo it because it's, it's already great, but it's what, like you said earlier, what if this was also, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles, but with romance. And I, for one, I also, I know it's not a, um, a John Hughes movie, but I also was channeling the movie, the sure thing, um, which is like another road trip romance movie of the <laughs> 80s. And so in my mind, it was like a culmination of the two that made me very happy. So I love that. yeah, I love that. Well, and then Miss Allie, who has a podcast dedicated to romance and rom-coms, Romance Ever After. Um, I would love, first of all, if you could 
talk about the rom-com bracket because some of the movies that we've even mentioned just in this discussion um, have appeared in and even won the rom-com bracket. Yeah, so the rom-com bracket happens every February, kick it off on Valentine's Day. Um, it was founded by one Miss Bianca Hernandez Knight. Um, she is a costume, a uh, historical costume recreator. She's an Austinite. Um, she runs the Jane Con. Uh, that happens every year, which is a free conference for people interested in Jane Austen. Um, I think they're still taking pitches for panels right now, so you might want to reach out for that. Um, and I have been helping her out with it for the last couple of years, and she was like, hey, do you want to take it over? And so this was my first year doing it. Um, basically, it is just February madness for rom-coms. Um, <laughs> everybody gets to nominate uh, movies that they think should go on the bracket. And then I, like a chaos agent, um, see those <laughs> movies uh, into different categories. And, you know, it is just daily polls of people voting for their favorite movies. And if uh, muskrat is killing poles for people who don't pay we will be finding a new home do not worry we will be finding a new home probably <laughs> tumblr which is where it'll get even crazier um but basically you know people's just they're just voting every day for the movies that they want to win and since you know it's not a sporting event the only way that we can spur people on is by yelling at each other online okay. all day long. Great. Um, <laughs> and this year, since it was my first year, I went bigger and better. So we did 128 movies. It's normally like 64. <sighs> and that was a lot. It was a lot. And a lot of people were <laughs> both angry and happy about it. But um, I think it was like a fun 10 days. A little stressful for me, but it was a fun 10 days. Yeah, and and I believe uh, the one that took it all home this year was while, while you were sleeping. sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> that makes Rightfully sense. So I approve. <laughs> uh, look, it was it was time for it to fight its way back because two years ago, um, somebody told Kevin Smith that uh, chasing Amy was in the poll, and it was voting for it the day that it was up against while you were sleeping and he told all his little minions on the go interwebs vote. i i go vote for chasing amy and oh my god just threw the poll well out of whack people were thanks very, a heap kevin smith very ah. salty very salty <laughs> so it was a redemption time. Yes, yeah, it was absolutely. Time. Well, and I'm curious, you know, as somebody who uh, talks about rom-coms regularly and watches them for the podcast, are there any any connections or realizations that you've made sort of about the romance genre as a whole from all of that? Yeah. So um, one of the things we do in the podcast is after we've talked about the movie, um, I always ask the person, you know, if this were to be a romance book, is there anything that you would change about it? Um, is there anything that you would do to make it like actual genre romance? And one of the biggest things we always know is that a lot of the times when it comes to the movies, what's selling the romance is the way the characters are looking at each other. Um, a lot of the heavy lifting is done by the actors themselves. So it's finding those ways to internalize um, those actions uh, to make it more visceral on the page for the reader because, you know, we get, when we see it happening, we get that, like, we get, we get the of visual cues of this is how you're supposed to be feeling right now. And so what's masterful about writers is finding the ways of making you feel that when it's on the page. And like, that's, that's always, that's always the most difficult part. Um, yeah, so I think that's like kind of the biggest thing. Yeah, I, I think that you nailed it for sure. Because, uh, you know, again, as somebody who kind of got started more with screenwriting than with book writing, I, I do think um, you are you are counting on the actors to really present well, and not just the actors, you're counting on the music, you're counting on the cinematography, mm -hmm. like there, there are so many components that go into it to hopefully elicit some sort of emotional connection. But when you're writing a book, 
you you just have the words on the page. That's all you get. So you're doing mm -hmm. the heavy lifting. You're doing all the work of all those people in one to, uh, you know, again, hopefully elicit some kind of emotional reaction from the reader. So yeah, an extra, extra challenge indeed. So um, that's so interesting though. I love, do you have a favorite rom-com that you've covered for the podcast that you and your guests have like agreed on would make like an excellent romance novel? Oh God. There's so I'm many sure movies. there's a million, but I'm putting you on the spot, of course. <laughs> yeah. And like you're asking me to rely on my memory. Thanks. Um, oh, that's right. We just had the golden retriever moment. I forgot. <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, I would personally like to, um, have redo only you, but do it from the perspective of her sister-in-law. Only you? And I don't even know if I know that one. So that has, that stars Marissa Tomei and Robert Downey Jr., um and bonnie hunt is in it as well um she plays a sister-in-law um and the thing is uh marissa tomei's character is like she's she's very much a romantic and she believes in fate and all that stuff and what happens is when she's younger she and her brother are playing with a ouija board and it tells her the name of her her soulmate and you know she goes and gets it reinforced also by a fortune teller at a carnival. And, you know, 15, 20 years later, she's engaged to this guy whose name is not that name. Um, and, you know, she's having, you know, sort of second thoughts because he's very much a, uh, he's a podiatrist. So he's like very much a stick in the mud. Um, and she's still like flights of fanciful person. Um, and, well, she's trying on this hideous wedding dress that is her fiance, fiance's mother's wedding dress. She gets a phone call and it's the guy with the name who is supposed to be her soulmate. And she's like, oh my God, where are you? And because it's 1995, he's at the airport. She can run in to the airport <laughs> without a ticket. Um, she decides, she, she just nearly misses him. So she decides to chase him all the way to Italy and her sister-in-law comes along with her, her sister-in-law who is greatly unfulfilled by her relationship with her husband. So I, I, if, if I had to do a movie into a book, I would love to do only you, but I would like to do it from the perspective of the sister-in-law. Cause I feel like she gets screwed over in the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. I think that'd be fun. Well, and it kind of, it kind of reminds me of when I'm thinking about um, Kiss Her Once for me that Allison constructed this, this side romance that's also going on. I mean, it kind of in, ingrains itself and in, in becomes like a love square um, mm -hmm. as well in the story. But I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having multiple romances in, no. in a story as well. Yeah. I, I, I mean, so often, you know, the side characters become our favorite characters. And Very I true. love seeing the character fall in love on the page, too. Yeah. So that's a question, I think, too, for Allison and Livy is if, um, you know, as as authors who have, you know, kind of adapted or been inspired by these stories um, and gone on to write your own, has there been any moments of maybe creating new characters or having readers want to see more of characters that you've created um, it, to get their own book and then going at that point you're already going beyond the original source material to then kind of dive into a completely different story do you want to go first no you take it away <laughs> i have a lot of thoughts no um so one thing for me that I really enjoy and that fulfills me in writing is writing big casts of characters. So I already knew coming into this that it was going to be very challenging and it was going to be a new experience to really pare it down because that's that's the double-edged sword. You have two people, like planes, trains, and automobiles was these two people pretty much the whole time. So having them on screen or on page together. Um, so I really at first struggled, but then enjoyed finding ways to tie in these other people. And um, in the book, you know, they're both on their way somewhere important because there's that urgency of we have to get there. Um, so that right there was, okay, well, where are they going and why is it important to them and how all these, all these things. But 
Um, the two characters who I am thinking of are their best friends. And my favorite scene in the whole book is towards the beginning when they're trying to decide if they're going to share this car, this last rental car in the airport. Um, my main character, Cassidy, FaceTimes her best friend for like, hey, you have to see his face because I need to make sure that if I get you know, disappeared, <laughs> you have a face to match to it. So it becomes uh, a FaceTime scene between her, her best friend and the guy. Well, then the guy gets his best friend on FaceTime and says, well, now you have to vouch for me because they don't believe that I'm not a serial killer. And it becomes a <laughs> FaceTime. And so Fair. moments like that of, of bringing in other people were, was really fun um, and important. And that definitely wasn't something that I got from the original. But now the question I get the most from the book is, are these two side characters going to have their own story because they deeply, deeply did not get along immediately, forcefully for the entirety of their time on page. And what what is love if not hate fixing itself? So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's definitely the question I get the most is how can we get a story for them? And I'm like, I would love to write them. I already know what they're gonna do. So uh, we'll we'll see what I can we'll do with them. <laughs> well, there you go. That's exciting. Okay. Yes, and that's so like so gratifying, so rewarding to be someone like to get that message of I enjoyed these people and I want their story. Like that's truly the dream. Like that's what you want is to make somebody feel something enough to want another story. Like I I just feel so grateful for that. Allison, I'm sure you have something to add as well, but I did just have a quick follow up, Livy, and that is, do you feel like then? Is there any sort of obligation to then create another story inspired by another John Hughes classic to like kind of stay in the same sphere? Or is it just like we pull all the way away from that with the new story? Um, I, you know, I didn't think of that. Uh, now I'm going to think of that though, because oh, God. I, I don't oh, know. I love it. Um, okay. I, 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 say I know what I want them to do. I know that I want them to fall in love. Um, so let's be clear. I don't actually know that much, but like, <laughs> I, I'm now going to actually play with that. That's really interesting. I'm a sucker for like a theme in any way. Like anytime I can like try to carry a theme through something, whether it's an entire series or, you know, a, my Oscars party, you know, like whatever, like, I just, I love a good theme. So that's where my mind goes, but I can also see, I can see that as being like, almost like a hindrance. If it's like you, you convince yourself that you have to connect it to another story. Well, sometimes, like we said, it only takes that one element. Like if there's one, mm -hmm. Sure. Even if it's just the title or something. Yeah. Like, really people astray. There you go. <laughs> yeah, but there's no teenagers or anything. Like, you know? <laughs> no, but if I figure out how to do that, it's going to be like to Kelly. <laughs> the, the Great. I'll <laughs> take it. Next. To Kelly and John Hughes. That's it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Allison, over to you. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, I think that happens like in romance, especially because so many romance series like so many romance novels are series um, where it's like side characters are introduced to be future main characters. There's like right. always like a lot of questions about like, is this person going to get a book? Is this, you know, can we hear more? Um, but incidentally, like with Kiss Her Once For Me, the number one thing people wanted more of in that story was like they wanted a book about the grandmas. Um, yes. So like my book, you know, <laughs> features these like 82 year old grandmas who are just like drinking the whole time and that's their their function they're just kind of like drunk and high um at this like christmas party um and yeah and so that surprised me um that everybody was like oh i would just i would read like their book um forget about the like young people that you've created you know forget yeah, about like grandmas. that yeah forget about that side story no just like we would read about the grandmas doing whatever so um which I feel so, like I'm not like equipped to write a, a, like a love story about 82 year olds. Um, okay. but, I don't know. Yeah. Sounds like, sounds like they deserve like a little holiday short. Yeah. Well, I would love to give them that. I loved about the grandma specifically in your book is that it, it wasn't even the fact that they're drunk and high grannies, which I mean, let alone is, is already great on its own. Um, but I loved that they were, they were married to the same man that, one of them was the ex-wife of grandpa and one of them was like the widowed wife of grandpa. And I, I, that was what I loved about it was the dynamic of, wow, here you have these two women who were married to the same man and are now like besties and like bond. Oh, I just, that was like a dynamic unlike any that I'd read before. So that's what drew me to their story for sure. 
Yeah, which is why I like, I mean, in early drafts, because I love side romances, um, I always try to have like four too many and my editor has to <laughs> cut a bunch of them. And one of my side romances was like the grannies falling in love. Um, oh. And my editor had to be like, this is great, but no, um, <laughs> you can't do that. Like you already have a like side romance. Like we need time for like the actual main romance that you're telling. Um, yeah. so, like, Fair. Control yourself. Um, and I was like, okay, fine. Um, no, no queer grannies, I guess. So I was pretty sad about that. They're yeah. queer in our hearts. Yeah, exactly. In my heart for sure. Yeah. Yes. Deeply in love. Yeah. It's it's just so funny because I just rewatched while you were sleeping because of the rom com bracket. Because at the end of rom com bracket, we do like a live watch where everybody is watching and tweeting about it. And um, what I loved, one of the things that consistently came up was the grandma uh, in that movie. I think it's Elsie. Um, and mm -hmm. everybody was like, you know, Elsie and Saul. Like mm -hmm. there, there was something going on there at some point, oh, and it yeah. just just led my mind down this road. I'm like, ooh, you're right. I would love to know what kind of stories the two of them have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We love to see it. But um, <laughs> another fan fiction for another day. Um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, um, and I know we've mentioned that sometimes it's a matter of finding a story that maybe isn't even a romance, but making it a romance. But I think pretty consistently a lot of the retellings that we're seeing happening um from fairy tales to Jane Austen to uh you know Shakespeare and of course our favorite rom-com movies I think a lot of them do pull from source material that is originally also a romantic comedy um and I think it kind of just begs the question of like in a genre that is so built off of formula like what is it that's so replicable but also attractive about romantic comedies that we can like rewrite them time and time again i don't i think it's part of it's like what ali said too of like we love being able to take stories and then like put them in a modern context or just like put them into a different context that like mm -hmm. It's so interesting, um, or even with like Easy A, the way that like taking a classic story and then putting it just just in a different setting and seeing the ripple effect of like how that changes things can be really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that's definitely, yeah, part of it for me. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the times people are like just deeply fans of the stories and they just want to make it more relevant to them. And, you know, or they want, or they want to just be inside of it. Like, let's be honest, sometimes people just want to be inside of the story themselves. And so they write a version of it where they could have someone just like themselves in it. Um, and that, and as somebody who like, as people who enjoy romance, I'm going to assume people, despite what movies say, I assume that people who write romance enjoy reading it as well. Um, they they appreciate those beats and the the stories and the formulaicness of it like they love the formula because at the end you feel good right mm -hmm. you get that happily ever after it's that warm hug mm -hmm. and you just in i love what you said because when you as a reader finish a book i don't know about anybody else but my first thought is i want to do this or i want to experience this i want to live this i want to go to paris i want whatever it is i'm reading and um, the best part of writing is the writing. And I know like maybe that's not like universally believed, but for me, the best part of the experience is actually that like time when I'm so in the zone writing something and experiencing it. So when I watch or read something that's truly inspiring or fun or, you know, swoony, I just want to live in that moment for as long as possible. It's exactly what you said. So I think people see something and they might not recognize that what's happening is like inspiration, but they know that they just want it to keep going. And so mm -hmm. just somebody who's more inclined to create is like, oh, I'm going to make it. Whereas somebody who's a reader is I'm going to go find more of it. So it's just a different response to the same feeling. Yeah, that's interesting. I like the way that you put that. And I, I think that's, I think that's very true. And um, it, it makes me, it's making me think too of, um, of Nisha's series that she has and that, you know, she very much took, we see some version of Shakespeare's comedies in almost any rom, in almost any romantic comedy at this point. But um, I like, 
I like that she very much was like, I would love to see, you know, South Asian characters like in this mm -hmm. series and go from there. And, and I think we see it a lot when it comes to race, when it comes to gender, when it comes to sexuality, that um, we are seeing a lot of these updates and just, you know, like Allison said, we're making them a little bit more queer. We're, you know, putting in a cast of characters that are a little bit more representative of the world that we exist in. And I think there's something so wonderful about that. We should be doing that with all of our stories, whether or not they're original um, source material or, you know, being pulled from somewhere else. But um, that's what we all want, I think, at the end of the day, is to see and read about people who remind us of us, our friends, our families, because if the main message is that love is available for everybody, that everybody deserves this happy ever after, then we want to see that for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Um, we've talked about a lot of like the benefits of adapting source material. What do you think? Are there any drawbacks? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> do tell. Well <laughs> yeah, I feel like, I mean, I feel like one, of course, is expectations. Um, and like, yeah. Libby kind of made a joke about this where you were like, I'll use the title. And you're like, oh, I don't want to mislead anyone. Um, but that, like, once your book is marked as a retelling of any kind, people go into it with certain expectations mm -hmm. um, and can be disappointed, like, simply because like they formed assumptions and like yeah. it doesn't live up to that. Um, and then for me as a writer, like, it's also hard to decide, like you are playing within like sort of somebody else's rules or somebody else's structure a little bit and deciding like how much of that you want to keep and how much you don't. Um, and it can be, I think, tricky in that sense. I, I will say just in terms of the titles alone, as somebody who's only published one story so far, but I love a pun and I love a punny title, I very specifically chose titles for this series that I'm writing that are all pulled from classic Christmas movies um, that incorporate Los Angeles locations into the title. And one of the very first things my writers group kind of gave me just as a, like a word of warning was, what if people think you're recreating this movie that you're referencing and then you go in to write it and it's not that movie like do you think people will be disappointed and I said that's a very real assumption to make like I mean I'm going to try to preface it and say this is not love actually this is not you know a Christmas carol but um I do think as readers we do tend to make a lot of assumptions and that can be a hindrance to ourselves um and our reading experience when we do do that and I mean, even if we're talking about adaptations, I mean, like even with movies, people have such high expectations about what they're viewing. And I try and go into like any adaptation that I watch with the understanding that the source material still exists. It's not killing it. Um, mm -hmm. This is just some. This is just somebody's way of interpreting it. But I mean, like, look at the reaction to the latest Persuasion um adaptation yeah. okay <laughs> not to stay on persuasion so much but the visceral reaction that a lot of people had to it even though even though it did meet and qualify for all the beats of persuasion just because it wasn't exactly the way that um somebody had read the book mm -hmm. because it was set in period with period dress people had expectations that it would be something a little bit more faithful faithful to uh the story like um everybody's favorite version with um what's his name oh god i'm blanking on his name right now um but you know it's not it's it's not particularly faithful faithful no but it is it is a retelling of persuasion and it does mm -hmm. hit all the beats. Just you don't like it. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yeah, the thought I was having uh, as you were talking was like, for me, it's the audacity of myself to try to. <laughs> <laughs> like, I I was pretty sure the minute my title was um, solidified that it was going to be a, a situation of expectations for sure. sure. Um, but one thing I noticed in the early, like right when it was first starting to like go out in the world was thinking about audience, like planes, trains and automobiles has a huge like following from like older men mm -hmm. <laughs> so like it's actually maybe served me well because they're not picking up my book so the people who would be the most <laughs> mad about it are not the ones reading it but um <laughs> something that was so wonderful about the original was that it was just a really good like screenplay it was a really good film it was really it was applauded it was like 100 rotten tomato percent whatever whatever mm -hmm. so again, the audacity of me to try to even use the title. That was something I had to like reckon with and accept that like by, by the phrase, all the feels like, you know, I'm under like a certain age, like, le like I'm trying my best. I'm trying right. My best. <laughs> but I, uh, you know, and so I think actually the valley between the people who like, I mean, everybody likes it now because it's, you know, come or like reached other audiences, but originally the people who are so, who loved it the most are probably not going to read my book. And you know what? It's for the best. Except for my dad. Up yeah. I mean, like, you know, except for dads like Allison and I have who yes, dads. <laughs> love their rom-coms. Um, yeah, maybe. It's I don't know. I kind sounds of I was say it sounds like your dad and Allison's dad need to have their own little romance book club. Book club. I know. Uh, if only romance book club redux and it's your dad's. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love that. I don't think my dad would think really in depth, though. He'd be like, yeah, I was cute. <laughs> like, you know, that would be it. That'd be the end. Are you hang out with your dad? The entire conversation. <laughs> or like, oh, they, they mentioned this place where they had a milkshake. Like, we, huh. I want a milkshake. Oh. Like... <laughs> Oh, I want to read books. I want to go into a book and just be like, I really liked that croissant. I'm going to go get a croissant and then not have a single thought about anything else. That's it. <laughs> That's the whole thing. I will say this is something that, you know, especially because when I was reading Allison's book, I was so excited that it took place in Portland. Um, hilariously, too, also, like, uh, part of it is, like, following this, like, epic snowstorm. And I, I rethought about it when we had this epic snowstorm recently in Portland because I was like, wow. That does happen. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I do love when books will mention like actual places in in the books, because then I want to go on like a walking tour. I want to like go visit all of these places. So um, I would do that. I would do I would go get the croissant. I would go get the milkshake. <laughs> like I would be the person who would go do that. That's how I ended up in Forks, Washington when I was 19. So yeah. Of course. There you go. Sounds right. Yeah. There you go. You had to. Yes. <laughs> it had to be done. <laughs> I've been there too, I just saying. But <laughs> um, well, and then the last thing that I wanted to know from each of you, and this is kind of a two-parter, just and I'm gonna give them both to you at once because I feel like there might be like a little bit of thought that needs to go into it. Um, and that is is there a favorite um, adaptation that you've read um, thus far? And is there one that you haven't seen yet that you would like to see? Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just start because like the one that I read fairly recently was Pride and Protest by Nikki mm -hmm. Payne. Mm -hmm. And I love it. I, I am somebody who, um, as much as I love um, all of Jane Austen's books that I have read, I actually have like a running spreadsheet of Pride and Prejudice adaptations that go across like movies, TV shows, books. I have like a web series, a couple podcasts, <laughs> like just, I just keep it because I'm like someday I would love to teach a class that's just mm -hmm. talking about adaptations of this book um, and how many there really are. But I loved Pride and Protest. I thought it was so great. It's very, very modern. Um and just the characters were great. It was also much sexier than I thought it was going to be. So that was what well, anything is sexier than the original Pride, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. But um, I thought that one was a lot of fun. Um, and then as far as ones I'd love to see, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I went to school for theater. So like, I'm very familiar with Shakespeare and it's weird because I'm like, I kind of want to see somebody try to adapt 
the ones that aren't comedies, but like make them like comedies. King Lear as a comedy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah like, I'm just like, because I, I do think that in some of the tragedies, there are certain setups in like the family dynamics or things that are going on that I'm like, that's actually hilarious, but like, <laughs> it doesn't end that way. <laughs> so like, I, I, I do think it's there. I do think there is something to be found there. Um, especially if you wanted to go with like a modern royalty, a royal setting i do think that would be kind of cool but i'm not the one to do it it's just wishful thinking on my part because i don't know how you go about doing it because you would have to add in the romance and the comedy a lot of the time so we'll see and over to anybody else who wants to answer <laughs> i can jump in because i have tried to outline a rom-com version of hamlet like several times Thank okay. um, it's like That's very hard my mind i know it's weird but like <laughs> I, so I was a high school English teacher. So like I have read Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet because like we read it aloud. Like I have read those plays like literally 50 times. And so I feel like there should be some use of that skill. Like the fact that I know those plays by heart, like I should be able to somehow like parlay that into yeah. making money. Um, but it's incredibly difficult. So like stay tuned on that one because um, that play's messed up. But um, one of my favorite adaptations, that I, I also loved Pride and Protest. It was so good. Um, and I feel like there are so many Pride and Prejudice retellings. So it's kind of hard to like have a standout one. And right. I feel like Nikki Payne did an amazing job with that story. Um, but another one I really love is my friend Timothy Janowski. His next book oh. is coming out um, and it's called New Adult. And it's, it is sort of a 13 going on 30 retelling, like, um, but kind of like how Libby talked about where it takes like that nugget of like waking up and being 30, but in other ways is not very similar um, to 13 going on 30, but it's, I love it. Um, and so I highly recommend it. It comes out in August. I will say Timothy's holiday book, You're a Mean One, Matthew Prince is also fantastic. And I don't know if um it was met if, if there was any sort of like inspiration or source material behind that because all, all I could think when I was reading it was it was channeling so much of like David from Schitt's Creek oh that is that is literally the inspiration okay, okay. <laughs> that right? is, yeah I was like oh fantastic like, like, she's we, not gonna think it was that but no that actually was it was like great um or I think the um I think his editor tweeted like I, after, um, oh my gosh, Happiest Season came out. Um, oh, okay. His editor tweeted like, I want Happiest Season, but from Dan Levy's perspective. Fantastic. Um, so and, just Dan Levy and, in general. And, and like, just Dan Levy. All and around. So, yeah, Timothy was like, oh, I have that. I got that. Like, I'll send it to you. Um, <laughs> that's yes. so good. Yeah, no, and that was, um, yeah, that's because that's how when we did our, our, we did the 12 Days of Boobsmith and we talked about that book. I, that was that was, I was like, I don't know if this is meant to be giving me like David from Schitt's Creek, but it totally it is. is. So I'm yes. so glad that um, it came through. That's that's yes. all I have to say about it. that. Nailed it. <laughs> and I look forward to your Hamlet rom-com one day. Thank I'm you. Someday. That out Someday there. <laughs> I'll find a way for Hamlet and Horatio to be in love. Like it has yes. to happen. <laughs> I love that. I, you know, I'm not super, I'm not as well versed in Shakespeare as the, um, uh, certainly not as Allison who was, you know, <laughs> teaching it. And, um, but I do, I'm not sure how much to say, but I, feuding families is a very near and dear thing to me. And I am nice. working on something with feuding families. And so, um, there will be no Romeo and Julieting as a verb for sure, but there will <laughs> really be, um, big, loud, chaotic families because um one one movie that I love that I knew I wanted to do something with in whatever way I could was like a <coughs> wedding um, oh yeah so, I knew it from the minute you said loud families I was like oh my big <laughs> Greek wedding obviously it's coming it's <laughs> happening it's it, well it should be happening slowly and steadily but I just love um like I said before like the balance of getting characters in but not giving them too much page time like Allison was saying with the grandmas like that is my forever like hill like I'm climbing that hill but I just think the payoff is so rewarding when you do have those characters that feed into the romance that that yeah. truly are the village because 
you can always tell like when a side character is just there to be colorful side character and when their relationship really drives somebody to make decisions. And so I, I love thinking about that. But I did also want to say one um, one thing I loved was Dickinson on Apple TV. Uh, talk about taking, oh. oh my gosh, like, so not yes. even a story, but taking a storyteller and that's, oh my gosh, I know it's not a lot of people maybe have Apple TV, so maybe they're not as familiar, but it's the story of Emily Dickinson um, with Haley Steinfeld as her, or, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I, I mean, first of all, Haley, iconic, uh, the, they did a little persuasion with it, right? It's a little bit, a lot modernized. They're wearing period clothes, but they're like singing, like, Drake, it's 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 a whole thing, but love. Oh gosh, it is everything to me and more. I love it so much. <laughs> Everyone go out and watch Dickinson all all the seasons, but that's a great example of. I, I bet a lot of people didn't expect what they did with it, but mm -hmm. um, it was made for me specifically. Um, <laughs> age, age thirty three, <laughs> like I'm your audience, like it's me. Um, See, it, and I, it was made for lesbian English teachers as well. Yeah. Yes, like <laughs> um, I love that show. <laughs> It's like all of, all your bases are covered. Yeah. Yeah. I love the uh, like any any of the anachronistic changes. Like I mm -hmm. I love those. Like it takes me all the way back to like Knight's Tale. Um, because like for me that was like the first one that I saw that did yeah. something like that where you had this kick ass soundtrack and you know it's called a nonce hello like but <laughs> but it's you know you know Canterbury Tales like I mean it's it's so that's <laughs> at least the first one that I saw that did that and. Yeah. I like yeah. to think that everyone was inspired by A Knight's Tale. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just really love that, like, you know, the screenwriter, director for that, like, he gets all this power and, like, acclaim from writing L.A. Confidential, and they're like, what do you want to make? And he goes, this. A Knight's Tale, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> so how about you, Allie? Do you have any favorites or ones that you would like to see? Oh gosh. Um, I mean, so there is an adaptation of 10 Things I Hate About You that I actually really enjoy um by Loretta Chase called 10 Things I Hate About the Duke. It's not a it's not an adaptation of uh Taming, Taming of the Shrew. Of the Shrew. It's an adaptation of 10 Things I Hate About You. And like, that's a it, there's a difference. That is good yeah. to mention. Mm -hmm. um and I really I really enjoyed that so I I think that's like most recently the one that I read that stands out to me um an adaptation I would want to see ooh like of a classic or of okay. anything really of anything I mean, okay while you were so sleeping is a classic in my book <laughs> like <laughs> I don't I honestly don't know I I just always love seeing when story yeah. happens so I think I'm always really impressed and surprised by some of the stories that people do adapt. Like mm -hmm. it makes sense to me to, to go with a rom-com. Even John Hughes like has this whole, this very specific, um, you know, era in the eighties that I'm like, yeah, you could just say John Hughes comedy. And I'd be like, right, I'm right there with you. You know, Shakespeare, I get it. Jane Austen, I get it. But I feel like occasionally there's one that'll really surprise me. And I just think, huh, I'm going to read that because if nothing else, I just want to know what rom-com Hamlet looks like. Like, you know, yeah. so do I. I also <laughs> want to know what it would look like. <laughs> Sometimes you just want to see how they do it. Yeah. Like, that's, I think that's one of my favorite parts about like when, especially when romance like commits to being bonkers, like you're just, <laughs> you just want to be along for the ride to see how the hell do they yes. figure this out? How do they make this work? Yeah. And I and I think what's cool in the last few years is we've seen a lot more villain uh, retelling romances. We've seen, okay, she doesn't pick the prince. She picks the monster. We've seen kind of like uh, a different version of the side characters inserting themselves into romance novels. But a lot of the times they're the bad guys or they're the who we thought were bad guys. So I, I that alone has been like really fun to watch um and then you add in like the monsters and the aliens and everything and whoa that's a whole other thing but I, I love it I love it all so I just I kind of wonder like what will be next like if we've done not that monsters and aliens are going away anytime soon but if we've done our like fairy tale retellings and we've done our monsters 
what comes after that. And I have no idea, but I am excited to see. Pers personally, I think it's time to go back to paranormal. Bring back my vampires. Yes. Okay. And my shifters and like, I, I want, I want them to too. go back to that world. <laughs> we're due. It's been at least a decade since they were popular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's time. I think it's, I think it's more long overdue. So, um, I'm with you. I would be happy to see that again. So yeah, let's get back to that time hoping. where everybody wants bite marks on their neck. Yeah. yeah. You know what I would love to see is the, the blend of that, but with more comedy, I would love yeah. to see more rom-com paranormal, which and like that would that had a hate that had a heyday like in the early aughts like the the comedy paranormal like before the I feel like the Arjuno series has gotten a lot darker but like in the beginning it was a very rom com -y, but mm -hmm. with vampires yeah I think a lot of the Sookie Stackhouse series was too the series mm -hmm. that inspired True Blood I think a lot of it mm -hmm. there was like a lot of like small town comedy energy to it so yeah give me give me comedic paranormal i'm i'm here for it so yahoo well ladies thank you so much for joining me to talk about this how about we wrap up and everybody tell the folks watching and or listening at home where they can find and follow you and keep up with uh what's coming up next for you I, you can find me at Livy Heart Romance at 17 different social media sites. All of them <laughs> they are all the same. Livy Heart Romance. Um, planes, Trains, and All the Feels will be out in May. And then I have a surprise coming out in August that I haven't talked at all about. So that'll be something to look out for soon. That I'll be talking about. And yeah. <laughs> Um, you can find me on Instagram at Allison Cochran. Um, and I do not have a book um, coming out in 2023. My next rom-com um, will come out in spring of 24. It's called uh, Here We Go Again. And much like Livy, it is a like road trip romance. Woohoo! Um, you can find me at Ali is writing on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. Um, you can follow the podcast at Rom Ever After on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Um, I have a website, Ali K Parker. Um, if you go on to my Twitter, I have a pinned tweet where you can find me in all the annoying places. And I promise <laughs> I'm only most annoying on Twitter, like everywhere else. Like I I barely annoy you. Um, That's where I and follow <laughs> you most. <laughs> <laughs> um and i do plan on having some episodes come out early, soon so i the podcast is on all the regular spots <laughs> yippee yeah and much like uh ali's podcast boobies and newbies you can listen to wherever you stream your podcasts i'm at boobies podcast across <laughs> social medias and boobies and newbies.com. Yeah, I bet you you didn't think you'd ever say the word boobies so much in your adult life, but then you start a <laughs> podcast called Boobies and Newbies. But um, yeah, so everybody, thanks so much for tuning in to watch. And if you're listening to the podcast recording of this episode, thank you for that. And hopefully we'll be able to get Nisha Sharma here back sometime soon uh, for round two when we all discuss love is blind season four obviously <laughs> as we were doing before we started recording so <laughs> next time there will be a time and a place for that but <laughs> in the meantime thank you all again and thanks everybody for for joining us thank you thank you Thanks so much for listening. Tune in every Friday for a brand new episode of Boobies and Newbies. And don't forget, you can always catch up on previous episodes on your favorite podcast app or on boobiesandnewbies.com. Happy reading!